So uh, my name is Elizabeth Krumbach Joseph. Uh, Samir, Samir mentioned I, I work over at HP. Um, my job there is uh, Automation and Tools Engineer. Um, that's one of HP's many, many fancy titles for Systems Administrator. Um, and I work, uh, I don't actually work on any HP products directly. Um, I work on the OpenStack infrastructure team. So HP pays me to work on the OpenStack project itself. Um, the infrastructure team is what runs the whole infrastructure for the OpenStack project. So all the tools developers use, all the wikis, all the chatbots, all kinds of things that people need to use every day. Uh, my team runs the servers that um, runs all that stuff. Um, so that's what I do during the day. Um, I'm also a member of the Ubuntu Community Council. Um, that's one of the two governing bodies of the Ubuntu project. Um, we're all elected from the community. Um, I was just elected for a third term on the council. And we do a lot of things um, sort of on the soft skill side of things. When people need resources in the project um, or when there are disputes or other things, people come to the community council and say, hey, I need this resource or I need this problem solved. And we sort of put them in touch with people to solve these problems. And then um, for about 10 years, I've been a contributor in various levels to a bunch of different smaller open source projects. Um, so I wanted to sort of go through a few of these projects that I've worked on um, and talk about sort of what they look like as far as structure um, and, and what contributing to each one of them has been like. But some of the things that I work on myself. Um, I, I, some of this stuff, I have little asterisks. I get paid for some stuff and I don't get paid for other things. Um, so I say automated testing framework engineering. Um, I pretty much do that for work. Um, so we test all of the changes that land in OpenStack. Um, so if you commit code to OpenStack, it automatically runs through a bunch of automated testing. Um, your peers then do code review on it, and you typically have to get a few, you know, a certain number of reviews um, to get your code accepted. Once it's accepted, it then runs through more automated testing and does a bunch of um, functional unit and integration testing to make sure the code plays nicely with others. Because um, OpenStack is actually made up of a bunch of different projects that all come under the same umbrella and they need to work well together. So we make sure that they don't break each other, mostly. Um, so that's the stuff that I work on. We make sure the system runs, um, we add things to it, we parallelize it, parallelize it to make sure it's running fast enough. Because um, when you send code to the project and you wait two hours to get a response about whether it passed tests, you get bored and annoyed. So you have to make sure those tests are always running fast. And with the project growing so much, um, that's a, a never-ending battle. So I do that for pay. Uh, systems administration, of course, that's what I do. I make sure the wiki server is still running and our large little chat bots are running and the whole continuous integration system is running. Um, so that's what I do for pay, and then I also, in the Ubuntu community, um, I manage a whole bunch of virtual machines that community members are able to log into. Um, so I give them shell accounts if they need one. Um, some people have really bad internet connections, but they want to stay connected to the chat rooms because that's where we do all our work. Um, so I've given various people in the community shell accounts so they can <coughs> connect an IRC server to the shell and then always be online and not miss anything, even if they're you know, in southern Peru and have a lousy internet connection. Um, it also is common for people to want to try out a new web application. They want to use it for a project or something in the community. And people always need web space for that. Um, so I'll install something on one of my servers and have them go to town with it and do whatever they want. Um, so that's sort of volunteer systems administration. I manage all these servers for them and I bring up accounts and I do user management on all those. Um, and then I write a lot of documentation. Um, the OpenStack infrastructure team that I work on, it's a completely open source infrastructure, so if you wanted to see all of the server configurations, um, we have them up in a Git repository that's mirrored to GitHub. So you can go and look at all of our configuration files, all of our puppet files, which does automatic deployments, um, and pretty much everything except for passwords um, is, is up for the public viewing. Um, and so we have several companies working on this. So, uh, let's see. So we maintain a lot of documentation for this. Where's my Um, 
so we main, maintain a lot of um, documentation for our infrastructure because we're um, doing it in the open and we want people to be able to come along and say, you know, I need something in the infrastructure and we'll say, great, write us a patch and we'll add it to the infrastructure. Um, so just recently we had some guys who wanted to put up an asterisk server for um, uh, telephone stuff. So we worked with them and they gave us all the, all the configuration files and we put it on a machine and loaded it up for them and they were able to log on to it. Um, and our wiki is actually maintained by a guy at the Wikimedia Foundation. So all our project infrastructure is documented here. Um, so one of my projects since joining the team has been making sure we have everything documented very well. Um, so we explain to people how to make a change in the infrastructure, um, how we're doing backups, and then all the major services we run um, for monitoring and code review and everything. Um, it's all documented here. So if anyone wants to jump in, like they want to check out how we configure our, our monitoring, um, they can just go to this page and they know what file to edit in our public infrastructure and all that. Um, so I do lots of documentation here. Um, and then to get a, an idea of, of how many people are looking are working on our infrastructure, um, this is a, one of the one of the websites that has statistics. Um, so if I look at the infrastructure team. Um, we've got a bunch of companies who are all working on the infrastructure, so in my day-to-day -day work, um, so HP does like 27% of it, there's a few of us working on it. The OpenStack Foundation employs a few people to work on the infrastructure, and then we've got Red Hat, IBM, Samsung, Rackspace, names you may be familiar with, um, who are all also contributing to the infrastructure. Um, so every day I work with these people, um, so lots of HP people and IBM people working together. It's kind of strange, but <laughs> so. And the slides started from the beginning. <laughs> so I write some documentation for our infrastructure, um, and then I also do some documentation in the Ubuntu project. I'm a member of the documentation team for Ubuntu itself, and then Zubuntu, which is actually what I'm running on this laptop. It's a flavor of Ubuntu with a different interface. Um, so it's developer and user facing documentation that I write. And actually the first contribution I made to an open source project was in the form of documentation. Um, I've been doing it for a while. Um, I give talks, as you may have noticed. Um, sometimes I'm paid to do them. Um, HP sends me around. I've, I'm usually at a conference like every every month or every other month. I'm off somewhere doing a talk at a conference. Um, but like like here, um, so Samir called me and, or you know, emailed me and said, hey, you want to come to my class? And I said, sure. And it's not like I went through any official outlet with HP, and he didn't contact me because I worked at HP, he contacted me because I do open source, and he knows me from that stuff. Um, but I did tell HP that I was coming and doing a talk, so it's, I'm, they're recognizing that I'm here, but I'm not necessarily being paid to be here right now, whereas some talks I am. So, I mean, I do this for fun. I enjoy talking about open source. Um, so sometimes I'm paid, sometimes whatever. Um, and then community management, um, sort of in my role in the Ubuntu Community Council, that's something we call sort of community management, um, managing resources and people and everything um, to make sure the project is, is moving smoothly. Um, oh, and if anyone has questions, feel free to stop me like at any moment and ask questions. <laughs> um, I do some software testing for fun. Um, I have a bunch of machines at home, and so when Ubuntu is in the development phases, um, I'll do a lot of testing to find bugs. Um, it's, I love doing software testing because when the release comes out, all of my hardware works awesome. <laughs> so if you test, then all your stuff gets fixed before the release happens and then your stuff works. Um, and I also do some old stuff on like older architectures. Um, there's a flavor called Lubuntu, which runs on older machines. And they're the last sort of holdout in the Ubuntu community that still runs on old PPC Macs. So I have an old like G4 that I do testing on and it's awesome. <laughs> 
and it works really well actually. And I'm very sad that Apple has abandoned all those little machines because they're actually pretty nice still. Um, and then last year I, I also did a quality assurance event um, with uh, sort of a club in, in the area called Ubuntu California. Um, so we're just a local club of Ubuntu enthusiasts who do things around the area. Um, so one of the things I did last year was uh, set to put together a quality assurance jam. So I brought a bunch of people over to the Wikimedia office downtown, and I brought ISOs, and they brought their computers, and we all worked together to test on their systems and submit bugs and fix bugs and other things. So that was a lot of fun. So I do some event planning, too. Um, so I did that QA jam. For Ubuntu, I do release parties, um, most releases when I'm in town. And then, like, last night, I, I met with a bunch of people at a coffee shop. We call it an Ubuntu hour, and we all talk about Ubuntu and our <coughs> current projects and our cats or whatever. <laughs> and we just talk about it, and we have coffee, and it's fun. Um, so I do a fair amount of event planning as well. And I will mention that I have, like, the trifecta of free time. Um, I'm married, but my husband works at Google, so he's never around. I don't have kids yet, so I have, like, no worries about kids. And also, I work from home, so I have no commuting time. So I have like so much free time. That's how I can do all this. <laughs> so, um, right. So that's that's pretty much what I work on. I've been doing this ten years or so, and now HP sends me a paycheck every two weeks, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and I've worked in a variety of different projects. Um, open source. You can pretty much be anyone and create an open source software product. Um, you can be an individual who wrote a single script and put it up on GitHub as a free license, and now you have an open source project. So it's like one person has code, it's an open source project. Um, you could be a large company who develops something in-house, and when it's finished, you release it to the world and you give away the code, so that's open source. Um, they may not have a community, um, just because they do all the development in-house and that's sort of closed off to people, but technically their code is open source. And then you've got projects with you know a couple dozen people, projects like OpenStack and Ubuntu with hundreds of thousands of contributors, and things like the Linux kernel, you know, and uh, Apache, which pretty much runs the internet. Um, all different kinds of sizes of projects. Uh, Firefox, LibreOffice, they all have hundreds of developers. And then you have some projects that are largely volunteer driven. Um, a lot of those have to do with projects that don't really have a business purpose. Um, so OpenStack, very strong business purpose. Ubuntu, there's a fair amount of both. Um, it used to be a lot of just hobbyists working on it. Um, but now there's a lot of companies using Ubuntu, so there's a lot of money going into it now. Um, and then there's projects where a majority of the uh, people working on it are paid, um, either by one company or multiple companies. So I thought I'd go through some projects that I've been involved with and just talk a little bit about them, <coughs> how I got involved, and how they're structured. Um, the first project I got involved with um, is called Biddleby. Um, back when everyone used AOL and Messenger and Yahoo Messenger and all those IM things that no one uses anymore, um, I, I hated using them, but my sisters were on them, and so I had to use them because that was how I talked to them. They lived far away. So I had to have this stupid Messenger client open, and I use Linux and I have multiple desktops, so a window from my sister would pop up and she'd be telling me about her cat or something. And then I'd get distracted, and the window would be over here on this screen, and I'd be way over here. And then she'd get mad at me because I was ignoring her, so the window was way over there. So I, I was very frustrated with the instant messenger situation. Um, so I discovered this project called Biddleby, and it puts your instant messengers, it uses a gateway <coughs> to put them in your internet relay chat client. And I use IRC like all day long, because in open source, using IRC is kind of important. So in OpenStack, in Ubuntu, we have all our meetings on IRC. Um, when I say I'm working with people from IBM and Red Hat, we all chat on IRC all day. Like, that's how we do collaboration. So IRC is pretty much the center of my desktop world. So having instant messages come to that was super great for me. But it's something that doesn't really have a business purpose. Um, you would argue it sort of has a negative <laughs> impact on it because I'm talking to my sister about her cat instead of working. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a very small project. Um, the founder of it uh, is a guy from the Netherlands, and when I started using it, I joined their IRC channel, because that's what I do, and I was sort of sitting in there for a couple of months, and I hadn't really contributed to an open source project. Um, I didn't understand much about the tools, I mean, this is a long time ago. Um, I hadn't really used a revision control system for where they store stash code. Um, but I was sitting in their channel, 
And one day the lead developer, Wilmer, um, says, uh, our documentation is out of date. We need to rewrite it. But I hate rewriting documentation. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, anyone can write documentation, right? That'll be easy. So I learned two things very quickly. One, it's actually very hard to write very good technical documentation. Um, it's a skill. Even if you know how to write, writing concise te technical documentation is hard. And that is something I had not been trained on. So I wrote really bad documentation, but it was accurate. <laughs> so that was the important part. The flags were documented appropriately. So even though it wasn't great technical documentation, it was accurate. Um, second thing I learned is that a lot of open source projects use an XML-based format for documentation called DocBook. And DocBook is hard. So in addition to writing this really bad documentation, I had to put it in this XML format that I had never seen before. So this little tiny, like, that's easy, I can do a project turned into be like three weeks for just rewriting a quick start guide. Um, but it was really cool and it was really fun. And when the next version of the software was, was released, my name was like in the release notes. And that, that was so cool. <laughs> I was like, I did something awesome. <coughs> um, and so all of us were volunteers. Um, no one was paid to do this. Um, I actually met Wilmer uh, later because he ended up being hired by Google and ended up working with my husband. So we met up for lunch in Mountain View a few years back. Um, so I, we became very personal because it was a very small project. We got to meet at one point, um, and it was really easy to get involved. I mean, I was just sitting in chat, and I was like, hey, I can do something. And then when I was done, since I didn't really do revision control stuff and didn't understand any of that, I just emailed my, my changes to the lead developer, and he put them in the source code and everything. Um, so it was really easy to get involved. And, Processes weren't very formal, and everyone just sort of does this for fun. And Wilmer still works on it, even though he's at Google. Um, they're allowed to do some open source stuff. So he's continued to maintain this project. Um, and Middleby now supports uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook chat. So I use it for Twitter now. Um, and I don't, I don't, I think I, I did some documentation work for them like two years ago or something, but it, it hasn't changed a lot. So, um, so that's Middleby. Very small. I think there's. Maybe, like, Wilmer's the lead developer guy, and then there's people who drive through drive by patches, and people like me who pitch in whenever we need to update something. It's a very small, all volunteers. Um, then we move into a project like the Ubuntu Linux distribution, um, right? It's popular, it's huge, um, and as a Linux distribution, um, it's sort of a collection of other projects. So you have, it pulls down changes from Firefox, it pulls down everything from LibreOffice, and it all sort of builds together into this consolidated thing we call a Linux distribution. Um, so there's lots of pieces to it, and then in, in that process of bringing everything together, there's a lot of glue work to do to make sure everything works well together, to make sure everything's maintained. Um, and within Ubuntu, there's lots and lots of little projects. Um, we've got things like documentation, um, translations projects, um, and all of these really feel like small projects, like, like I, I've worked on with Biddleby. Um, for the documentation team right now, it's a very small team who writes all the documentation for Ubuntu. Um, so if you came along, um, we're, we're trying to get reviewers for the server guide right now. So if one person came along and did a really thorough review and offered some patches, they'd immediately be like an important person in the project, because we really don't have a lot of volunteers working on that. And no one's paid currently to work on documentation. Um, so that's a really easy team to get involved with. Um, if you're working on development, um, it may be a bit harder to get involved because you actually, once you become a bunch developer, you have access to the repository and then you have access to everyone's computer. <laughs> um, so there needs to be some sort of track record in the community and you need to have a sort of trust built up um, and go through a whole process to become a developer. So you have access to all of that. Um, but in some ways, there's some projects you can get involved with easily, some that are harder. Um, one of the other things I do in the community is I, I release a new bunch of weekly newsletter every week. And for that, I, I work with someone to collect links of a bunch of news all week. Um, I have one guy who's like, doing an amazing job, so I don't even need to do anything anymore. <laughs> so he collects links throughout the week, and then on the weekend I email out to like something like 40 people who have volunteered to do summaries. And I say, hey, go write summaries for all these articles. And the summary document is just a Google Doc that anyone can anonymously edit. And I send this link all over the place. Anyone can touch this document if you want to write an article somewhere to contribute something. So in that, I made the bar to entry like as low as possible. Um, once the summaries are written, a uh, few editors come in, we fix up the language, and 
make sure the style guidelines are being followed. Um, but the bulk of the work is really writing the initial summary. Um, so the edit editing work is much easier. Um, so Ubuntu is all these small projects. And um, it also has a large um, volunteer community and a large paid community. So you have um, this company called Canonical, who uh, sponsors Ubuntu. They own all the trademarks. They do all the legal stuff. And then they pay um, a few hundred developers to work directly on Ubuntu. And then you have people like me who are just volunteers. Um, so we do it in our free time. We do it because we love Ubuntu or are using it um, somehow in our work or life or whatnot. So there's a large mix of who's getting paid and who's not. And it leads to a very interesting dynamic in the community. Sometimes really cool, sometimes really not. <laughs> if someone feels they are not being properly compensated. Um, so that's Ubuntu. I also work on OpenStack, as Samir mentioned. Um, this is another large project. Uh, with the last release, uh, there were um, code commits from over a thousand developers. And these, I showed you the stack of, the stack of analytics um, for OpenStack um, on the infrastructure. The one for the whole body of OpenStack is very similar to that. You've got HP and Rackspace and IBM and all these big names throwing lots of developers at it. Um, IBM's really stepped up this, this cycle and added a lot of developers. So now HP is like, we, we were in the top three for a little while, and now we, I think we're still in the top three, but IBM's ahead of us now it's, as far as code contributions. But it, it, that sort of rivalry is really awesome in the community because we actually do work together and we care about the same goals and we all work together. We don't really pay attention who works for who, but all the management types are like, oh, these stats are like, we need to be at the top. <laughs> but, you know, so we, we all work together from different companies. Um, somewhat different than Ubuntu, um, there's not really a big culture of lots of little individual teams. Um, all the teams pretty much are contributing in the same way. There's the code review system, and there's um, the, the syntax checking and software checking, integration testing and everything. So even the documentation team has to go through code review. Now in their case, it's not code, it's documentation, but they all use the same system. Um, translations also go through a review process and syntax checking and other things. And all of this is, is very well documented in the project. So when people are contributing, they follow the same contribution um, guidelines. Um, so it's all pretty standard throughout the project. If you know the code on one project and you're start, starting to get familiar with the code on another project, you can easily move over. Um, whereas a project like Ubuntu or Biddleby, you sort of have to get familiar with the community and search out what you're trying to look for and figure out how to get involved in that little area. Um, I think one of the reasons OpenStack built this model is because most of the people are paid to do work on it. So they need um, a quick and easy way to get their job done. Um, companies don't want to send people to work on open source projects that are going to take them even three months to figure out how to contribute a line of code. So there's been a lot of attention paid um, to making sure that's all well documented and easy to get involved. And I mentioned most of the contributors are paid. Um, OpenStack is growing like crazy. Um, it just had its third birthday, um, but in that time, the developer community has grown like 10 times um, so in like the past two years, so it's, it's really picking up steam. So pretty much anyone who has open source experience um, and wants to work on OpenStack can find a job. So it's not even that everyone goes out to be paid, but if you start contributing to OpenStack, you're going to have a company come along eventually and say like, hey, we should hire you. <laughs> um, there was positions open for documentation writing and um, all different types of work throughout the project. Um, and that's sort of like, yeah, most of the contributors are paid. I don't even think I know any. There are, there are a few volunteer contributors that I know. So, yeah. What exactly is documentation writing? Is it lines of code? Or? Um, so, uh, I think I'll show you some. Um, there, there's two sort of types. So there's the documentation that's developer facing, which will tell you how to contribute to a project. Um, like, it'll tell you what the code structure is, um, what the syntax they're looking for is. Um, what their sort of plans are, like they have blueprints that they write up for a cycle and show developers like what features they're working on and what direction they're going in. So there's developer facing documentation and then there's the user facing documentation which is like the book you get with your computer. 
Um, so it's like for OpenStack, there's an operations guide, which will tell systems administrators like how to set up OpenStack, um, how to figure out what hardware to use, other sort of tips for configuring the software. Um, so the documentation team at OpenStack fo focuses on all the user-facing documentation. Um, so all the step-by-step -step guides and all that kind of stuff. So. And you have to be pretty savvy to work on that, because you need to know how it works to write the documentation. So. Questions? This talk isn't actually an hour, so you should ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's OpenStack. Um, I, I really enjoyed working on it, um, partially because my, my with my job at HP, um, I was hired because I knew a lot about open source and I'm a systems administrator, so it was actually a very good good fit for me. But I also have a lot of autonomy to sort of work on what I feel needs to get done. And when you become an open source contributor and do a lot of work in open source, um, you sort of have to get get an eye for what needs to be done in the community. Um, Oops. <coughs> um, so my boss may say, well, my boss is always traveling and is never around, but he may say at some point, like, hey, you should go work on this this thing. It needs a little bit of attention. Um, but that's happened once since I started working at HP. I've been there almost a year now. And there's only been one time where he's been like, oh, hey, this needs attention, and I go off and work on that for a bit. Uh, mostly I get to choose what I work on. Um, we uh, Over the summer, we realized that we didn't really have um, a very good public-facing Git interface for all of our repositories. So everyone was linking to the GitHub <coughs> links for our repositories. GitHub is great, but it's closed source, and we don't like supporting it. It is a company, and as a, as a foundation, the OpenStack Foundation, we didn't really feel comfortable with all those GitHub URLs being everywhere. So we wanted to launch our own git.openstack.org and have people start using that, because that is open, so that would be open source. So over the summer, I was like, I want this to happen. I want to get us off GitHub. Now, we still mirror to GitHub. That's where people look for code. Um, but running our own web interface to, to uh, browse the code was super important. So I just sort of one day was like, we should, we should do this. And so I evaluated a bunch of um, web interfaces for Git, and then we finally set one up one weekend for one week. And now we have git.openstack.org, and that's my baby. <laughs> Um, so it was really exciting to work on that because it was fun for me and it was something that you know we, we sort of wanted to do in the community for a long time. So I have a lot of flexibility in my job to um, fill needs like that. So I enjoy it a lot. Plus it's open source, which I love. So I think you guys might have talked some about why companies use open source. So this may be all boring. <laughs> uh, so there's reasons companies use it. Um, Avoiding vendor lock-in, um, uh, you may know there was a lot of trouble in the 90s and the zero zeros. Um, what do you call that? <laughs> the last decade. <laughs> um, um, with uh, companies either um, getting locked into a vendor and the vendor um, making the prices much higher, so all of a sudden all of their data and their entire business was locked into this model of software, and then the vendor decided to triple the price and now they're paying all this extra money and either they have to pay the money and start firing people, or they can't pay the money and now their business is going under because all their data is locked into this thing. Um, the other thing that would happen is companies would go out of business, so they would have all their data locked in this thing that is no longer being maintained, and a lot of the systems are still around. They just sort of hobble along and they hope the server boots up next, next week. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of vendor lock-in. There's not a lot they can do about it. Um, some companies will pop up and do like exports of data from these old systems that are now obsolete. Um, but it became a serious problem. So a lot of companies were switching to open source software. Um, because even if the company behind the open source software somehow went out of business, they could hire people to come in and retrieve their data or add patches or fix the software um, because it's open source and they had the access to the software. Um, so that was super important for a lot of companies who ended up in this situation, and I think a lot of other companies sort of learned from that. Um, other companies just do it because they need to get something <coughs> specific patched. Um, maybe they ran into a <coughs> workflow problem, or um, a bug, or a security issue, and they decided to patch the software. Um, usually how this goes in a company is they will download some open source software, patch it a bunch internally, and say like, oh, we want to add all this stuff to it. And then a new version comes out, and they try to apply their patches, and it's not so bad, like they have to fix a few things, but they get their patches in. And then another revision comes down a few months later, 
and their patches get increasingly hard to apply to this piece of software. Um, that actually happened for a product in HP where they grabbed the source stuff and started maintaining all these patches. And it got to a point where they couldn't even use upstream software anymore because they couldn't upgrade because their patches were so such a big mess. Um, so usually after that happens, the company realizes that this is not the way to do open source. So they start contributing their patches to the project directly. And that's a big way that a lot of companies get involved, just because they say, we don't want to carry all these patches, because every time the software comes out, it's a big nightmare for us. So by contributing them directly to the project, it becomes um, part of the project. And when the project is upgrading their software, they keep that patch in mind, because they know it exists. Um, so that's usually how most companies sort of a roundabout way to finally get into contributing to open source, because they don't want to carry patches anymore. Um, Leveraging a, a larger development team, uh, this is definitely what OpenStack is a, is, is a result of. Um, you have Amazon, who has, uh, if you're familiar with AWS and the stuff that Amazon does where you can buy time on servers, they are pretty much the market leader in this space. So when companies um, like Rackspace and HP want to come do something like that, um, Amazon stuff is all closed source. That's all of their software. Um, it's not available to other people. So once upon a time, Rackspace and NASA were both working on some open source software to run a cloud, like Amazon does. And in the same month, July of three years ago, um, they both announced that they had this product. And they were like, and, and fortunately, they, they decided to work together. And that's what OpenStack is. It's a, initially a collaboration between a company called Rackspace and NASA. Um, so they sort of put their development teams together. And then that's when companies like IBM and HP and other ones start coming in saying, hey, we want to run our own open, you know, we want to run our own cloud too, but we don't, we can't spend, you know, all this money on all these developers um, to build our own. So they all got together on OpenStack and it really picked up. Um, it, it's somewhat amazing that after three years, there's already, um, it was actually after a year and a half, people were using OpenStack in production which is um, pretty exceptional for an open source project. I mean, Linux wasn't used in production for like five years. <laughs> um, so yeah, so they could leverage a huge development team. I mean, a thousand developers is a lot of people. And when it's split up between a lot of companies, that's really great. So the Linux kernel and OpenStack and other big projects that everyone uses, the development efforts spread out. Um, and then, uh, uh, Licensing was mentioned. Um, OpenStack's all Apache licensed, so if a company does want to add their secret sauce or you know, magic to make it better than everyone else's, um, they can do that without releasing the code back. Um, if it was GPL, it'd be different. Um, and one of the interesting things I've learned working for a company is I now have to pay attention to licenses and I have to pay attention to contributor li uh, license agreements. Um, so HP doesn't really like it when I work on AGPL stuff with work. Um, we can't use AGPL stuff in OpenStack. Um, so we really have to use permission, permissive licenses, so Apache, MIT, GPL v2, v3 is, uh, makes the lawyers nervous, but sometimes you gotta use GPL v3. So yeah, I pay attention to licenses a lot more than I used to when I was just working at a little small tech provider. Uh, support and development contracts. Um, the big way that a lot of the companies working on OpenStack, for instance, make money is because in addition to running something like a public cloud, HP has hpcloud.com, the public cloud. Um, they go into companies and um, will set up a, pub, a private cloud or a hybrid cloud for different companies. And this is the business model for a lot of companies doing OpenStack. Um, so there's ones who are focusing on different parts of it, like they may um, offer a huge storage solution for really big amounts of data and they're using OpenStack. Um, I think uh, the NSA actually came to an OpenStack summit before they got in trouble with all of us <laughs> and uh, talked about how they used to, like, people would submit a, a support ticket to them like, when, in the organization, in the NSA, all the secrets are. Um, they would submit a ticket with IT and be like, I need a virtual machine. And, like, someone would manually spin up one for them, like, you know, two days later they'd get a virtual machine. But they started using OpenStack so then their employees could, like, log into the system and just create a, an OpenStack instance themselves and they didn't need to ask permission or submit a ticket or do whatever. So they're, a lot of companies are sort of going to that for their developers. Um, so they don't need to give them all servers and they don't need to open support tickets to set up a VM for them. OpenStack's been a really great option for 
giving them all accounts and letting them all do it themselves. Um, it's also displacing VMware in some places where it's um, becoming what they use instead of VMware, which is very, very expensive. Um, so there's a lot of um, companies in that space going in and saying, we'll set up OpenStack for you. Um, and being part of the community is super important for that because companies learn that you know, if you're in the top three of OpenStack developers, you may be the company they want to go to to set up their cloud because you obviously know what you're doing. Um, so that sort of leads into like having goodwill and influence in the community. Um, one of the things HP likes about when I talk to people like here, you know, it's, it's, it looks good for them because they're hiring, you know, really dedicated open source people like me to work on these projects. Um, and it also means that clients will be like, oh, hey, they know what they're doing, we should go with them. Um, and it, influence is also a big thing. So if HP is putting on, you know, 150, I don't know how many developers we have, it's over 100 um, developers on, on OpenStack, that gives us a certain amount of influence in the project. So if we want a new feature, we put engineers on it and that feature gets moved through the process um, of being developed in OpenStack. And that's super important for companies, obviously, if they're working in one of these big spaces where it's an open source project and anything can happen. Um, so it's important to have that sort of influence and one of the reasons they may want to work on it. Um, so that's companies. And then you have people, like me. So obviously the first reason that a lot of people do stuff is to get paid. That's super important, um, because if you don't get paid, then you can't eat, and that's bad. Um, so I work with some people at HP um, who have done like intern, like software development internally for a long time. Um, so they've done you know proprietary stuff their whole life, and then now we're sort of transitioning to open source more stuff that we work on. Um, so I've been called like I, I usually work from home, but sometimes they make me come to the office to talk to people about open source. And the office is far away. <laughs> um, but I come in and I, you know, I tell, I'll tell them about how to work in open source. But these people are not like passionate about open source. They don't really care that it's open source or closed source. They're writing code and they're working for a company and they're getting paid. Um, and there's a fair number of these people in the open stack community. I mean, they may have always done um, proprietary software, but now they're working on open source and they're doing it because they're getting paid. Um, there's really cool open source people I work with now who used to do a lot of work on MySQL, and now they're working on OpenStack because now they're getting paid to do that. I mean, they still care about MySQL because they were in that community for a while, but now they're getting paid to do something else. Um, and then also in a similar way to companies, maybe someone just needs to write a patch for something, like their software broke and they want to fix it, and so now they write a patch. Um, and just like companies, they don't want to maintain the patch themselves, so they submit it to the project, and now they're an open source contributor. Okay. <laughs> um, there's also passion, which is obviously my problem. <laughs> I love open source, and I love being able to give computers to anyone in the world with free software. Um, I work with a nonprofit in the Bay Area um, also, and we put computers into schools. Um, so we take used computers, put a bunch of base distributions on them, and give them to schools. Because it turns out there's schools in San Francisco that don't have computers, which is pretty crazy. We live in Silicon Valley, and there are schools without computers. So we want to fix that. Um, and that's just stuff we do for fun. We love open source. We love the idea. We love giving it to people. Um, another big one is, is getting experience. Um, you don't really need to be anyone special to start contributing to open source. Um, you don't even need to know how to code because like, you can write documentation or do summaries in a newsletter or you know, do something that's not hugely technical. Um, and, and through that, you start gaining experience. Um, you can start getting into programming, maybe writing, like maybe starting to understand bugs that happen, and then writing small patches, which is a much less daunting effort than writing a whole piece of software yourself. So fixing bugs can be a really good way for people to start learning how to code and figuring out what sorts of problems arise in code. And you can do this like in evenings and weekends, and you can do it for one hour a week. Um, and that starts getting you real experience that shows up like you can put it on your resume. I mean, I do. I have tons of open source stuff on my resume. So it takes you know, a computer and an internet connection, which is not much of a barrier for entry for anyone here. Um, but other than that, you know, you're pretty much on your way. You can start contributing and get experience. Um, I know a lot of people, when they were looking for jobs, they spent a lot of time at open source. They, you know, they'd spend their days 
calling companies and putting their resumes in and doing interviews, and in the evening they'd be working on something in open source because you can't be looking for a job in the evening, so what are you going to do? You're going to improve your skills and get involved in a project um, where you can show off the work that you're doing. Um, and actually, I, I spent, before I got my first systems administrator job in 2006, I was doing like temp work, I was working with temp agency, um, because I couldn't find work, I was living in Philly, there weren't any jobs. Um, so, I, and, but in my evenings and weekends I was doing open source stuff, so it was through my, my open source stuff that I was hired at a company that was run by the guy who runs the local Linux users group in Philadelphia. Um, so he's like, hey, you're pretty sharp, you want an IT job? Yes! <laughs> so I was able to get my first job because I was working in open source and they knew of my work. Because it was all out there, you know, I was clearly running servers and doing other things. Um, another interesting one is um, travel. So I didn't really think this would be part of open source. Um, my first, when I first got involved in open source, I wasn't traveling much. Um, but as I really got involved more, I realized that a lot of open source stuff. Um, there's a lot of conferences that happen, um, and when I was working with. Uh, the Ubuntu project, they used to do developer summits every six months. And they had developer summits all over the world. So they'd send a bunch of people from the company, uh, Canonical would send a bunch of people to the developer summit. And then they send 60 selected community members to the summit as well. So like expenses paid, you know, flight and hotel and food for a week to attend this summit. So since I was a pretty high profile contributor in Ubuntu, I always got sponsorship when I asked for it. So I was one of those 60 people who got to go. So I got to go to Brussels and Budapest, and then a bunch of places domestically, you know, Dallas and Orlando, places for these developer summits. Um, and that was pretty awesome. Like I, I finally got out of the country and got to see parts of the world because an open source project was sending me to do it. Um, with OpenStack, um, they, they have modeled a lot of their uh, workflow around Ubuntu, so they have design summits. Um, so I was just in Hong Kong last month for a design summit. Um, I'd never been to Asia before, so that was pretty cool. Um, and then uh, next month I'm going to Australia to give a talk at a conference about the work that we do. Um, so I'm traveling all lots now. HP pays for it, or Canonical pays for it, or other things in, in my open source world pays for me to travel. And then I always add a couple of days on the end of my trip or before my trip, before the conference, to sort of see the sights. I mean, I don't know that I would have ever gone to Budapest on my own, but I'm super glad I went because it was, it was an awesome place and they had a really cool zoo. <laughs> um, oh, and last year I, I went with a non-profit to Ghana and we were deploying a bunch of base desktops um, there in Africa. And I know Samir travels all over the place to do his OLPC stuff. <laughs> So um, there's a lot of volunteer opportunities um, if you take some time off. So I took a month off last year to do that. Um, it was sort of when I was sort of between jobs. And I, I actually told my, my old boss, like, I'm going to take a month off. You can fire me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was fun. So I, I was sort of their Linux expert on that trip to Ghana. And again, I don't know when I would have had the opportunity to do that if not for my, you know, it was volunteer and I wasn't paid for it. But, I was able to get, so the nonprofit paid for like a thousand dollars for our trip, and then I went online and crowdsourced the rest of my expenses, and that worked. I got, I got, like, I hit my goal of like two days. <laughs> People on the internet are awesome, <laughs> and crowdfunding is awesome. Um, so I, I was, that trip was pretty much paid for for me um, to go to Ghana and help out those schools. And then some people do it for the recognition. Um, you, you'll probably not become a household name by working in open source. I don't think there are any. I mean, I don't know, is Linus in a household name? I don't think Linus is. In this house. Is he? <laughs> <laughs> in this house, yeah. And maybe here, but I I mean, and then you, like Mark Shuttleworth, I mean, he's a pretty big deal, but to us. But, so you, you probably won't become world famous, um, but you definitely can build a name for yourself in an open source community if you do a lot of work and are very committed to it, even if you're paid to do the work. Um, there's a lot of stuff around recognition, and it feels really good. Um, when you work a lot on a project, um, I I won an open source award from O'Reilly last year, and I had to check the email to make sure it was actually to me and it wasn't a mistake. <laughs> but it, it felt really good, you know, you're doing out there doing all that work, and you know, you've, like I'm passionate about it, so I love doing the work, but being recognized and having that little thing I get to put on my wall and frame, that was that felt really good and was super motivational. Um, so some people do it for that, they want to be known in the community, um, they want to sort of be you know, famous in their sphere, and it's super motivating for a lot of people. Um, so recognition can definitely um, be part of why people contribute to open source. So 
And that is all I had. So, anyone have any questions? <laughs> yeah. I have a question about uh, when you talked about Vinci. Mm -hmm. When you work in Vinci, you get to access some everybody's computers. <laughs> oh, so, yes, what I was referring to was um, the uh, packages that Ubuntu downloads. Those are all stored in a repository of packages. So in theory, if you had a malicious developer who no one is watching, they could upload a nasty package to that package repository, and then it could land on all your computers. So there's a lot of peer review and trust that go into the developers who have access to these machines. So yeah, that's how, I mean, it's never happened in Ubuntu. <laughs> And I, I don't think it's likely because there is a lot of gatekeeping and stuff. But in theory, you know, you have to be trusted enough that you will, you know, be good with your packages. Um, Ubuntu also has something called PPAs, Personal Package Archives. If you've used Ubuntu a fair amount, you may have used them. Um, these are packages uploaded by any any random person on the internet. Um, and there, are a lot of news sites around Ubuntu often tell people to use them, but I tell people maybe not use them, because people can put whatever they want in these package archives. And since you install Ubuntu packages as the administrative user on your computer, that package can have any sort of code in it, any random code, like it could remove your entire file system. So, <laughs> um, but, but for official packages, that doesn't happen. And, but yeah, but that's what I meant by they can get into all your computer. Like if they put a backdoor in a package and it ends up in the repository, we'd have a big problem. <laughs> I have a question about yeah, that. It's something about like what kind of you were talking about uh, troubleshooting issues earlier. And I was wondering if you could give a good example of something that you that's come up in one of the programs that you released and you've uh, been able to fix it. Like, like a technical issue? Yeah. Well, there was something up there. I forgot the exact question, but that's pretty close. Cool. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, so in, in, in the development cycle, um, yeah. like in, there's things like if my graphics card isn't working quite right, um, that could be like a kernel bug, um, or it just could be a configuration issue um, that shipped with the system. So what can happen is I can file a bug against that, and they can look and see how many people are having this issue and maybe change a configuration thing, or actually make a change to the kernel to fix that graphics bug. Um, there was also a, an instance sort of more on the social side a uh, few cycles ago where the guy who was running translations for Ubuntu sort of, he, he works for Canonical and he sort of got reassigned. Um, so the translations team was sort of left in this unfortunate limbo where no one was opening the things for translation, um, no one was doing calls for translation. So it got to be something like three weeks before release and none of the translations people knew. But they were like, where's the translations? And so, they had to come to the community council. We had to like go track down the guy who was supposed to be doing this and talk to the the admins for the software and be like, hey, can you can you open up translations for these people and get this rolling? And so we had to work with them to make sure translations got into that release. And translations are super important for Ubuntu because like it's translated all, all over the place. And when translations don't get done for a release, they have all the translation strings from the past release. So you end up with a release that has like half translated stuff, which is, I'm sure it's very very frustrating to people who don't speak English. So that was something we were able to fix. And I think most of the translations ended up getting done that cycle, but the translations team was not happy at all. <laughs> oh, one other question. Yeah. Ubuntu has its own cloud service, doesn't it? Ubuntu yeah, they have Ubuntu 